Hi, I'm Gary Gray, and I'd like to welcome you to Stonegate. Thanks for spending part of your Sunday with us. If you're new here, we want to help you find the best place to fit in, so stop by the information desk out in the foyer that's right outside the auditorium. We'll answer any questions that you have and make sure that you know everything going on in our ministries. And when you get home, check out StonegateFellowship.com where we're always updating and adding new events and groups. Here's a look at a few things coming up on our calendar. You only have a few weeks left to sign up for our first Love and War Retreat Weekend of the semester. Anyone who's married can sign up to go on this Friday through Sunday trip to Glorietta as we work our way through the Love and War Bible Study. This trip is March 20th through the 22nd. Sign up and find out more details in the foyer or in the church office. If you haven't signed up for camp yet, do it today. Both Stonegate Kids and Siggy are at the center table in the foyer. We have computers and notaries so you can take care of everything in one place. You only need to put down $50 to save a spot and you have until the beginning of May to pay the rest. Current fourth and fifth graders can go to kids camp and current sixth through 12th graders are eligible for Siggy camp. Stop in the foyer today to sign up and ask questions. In preparation for Kids Camp at Glen Lake, we need a group of men to help us prepare the campgrounds. March 27th through the 29th, we're going to work at Glen Lake on the interior of a few cabins that the kids will stay in this summer. The trip is free. We just need extra hands to get everything done. So sign up in the foyer after the service or call the church office during the week. Elements is this Wednesday night at 7. Both campuses meet in here for baby dedications, baptism, communion, and worship. We hope to see you then. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Head out to the information desk in the foyer or log on to StonegateFellowship.com. And if you're on social media, be sure to look for us. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Hey, good morning, Stonegate. Everybody good this morning? You made it here safely, and you're out of the house. If you've been locked up in your house for the weather the last few days, it's nice to get out. We're glad that you're here with us this morning. I know that, uh, well, from this perspective, I can still see some seats, especially over on this side of the room, but our ushers are desperately trying to fill seats. We've got a lot of people coming in a little bit later on here. So if you can help them by either squeezing in toward the middle of your section or making sure they know you have a seat, available in the middle of that section. They may have a hard time seeing it here in a moment when we stand, and any help you can provide them would sure be appreciated as they try to get people seated this morning. I'm David McReynolds. I'm one of the staff guys here, part of the team, and um, it's my privilege to get to lead you this morning. Um, we've got a great, great morning ahead for you. Scott Hall is going to be um, continuing our series in Steadfast. He's got uh, just a great, great message this morning. So uh, I tell you what, as we get started, I know our guys are still trying to find seats. This might be a good time for you to stand up. Let's uh, introduce ourselves to someone around you that you don't know and uh, help us get folks seated in the middle of these sections, if you would, please. Thank you. He's a mighty warrior. He is triumphant in all things. And as his children, we are triumphant in all things. So we celebrate this morning. You call us out from the depths into your freedom. Our chains are gone.
Thank you for just reminding us the foundation of our lives in Christ. God, our Father, Christ Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, guiding, directing, informing, instructing, correcting all those things in our lives, Father, being all to us. I pray this morning that we would just Remember that, Father. Be reminded that you are our all in all. As we've sung, you're a mighty warrior. There's nothing you cannot conquer. You are victorious over it all. And in that, may we find peace in the truth of who you are. You're enough for us, Father, in every situation, in every trial every valley, whatever situation you're walking us through, you're enough. May we be at peace with that and not search for more. And may we know what we believe. May the truth of who you are dwell in us. And may 
we be reminded of that daily. Father, as you're walking us through this incredible series, you're stretching us, you're pressing into us to be steadfast, to hold fast to you. We will also sing in a moment of our, our desperate need for you. Father, just pray that we trust you with our lives, with all that we are. May we trust you. We will continue to worship as we give a tithe and an offering, a response to you because of your graciousness to us. The very breath we breathe for life to everything we hold as possessions. It's all because of your grace and your mercy. And we respond to you with gratitude this morning in that. May we bless you in this. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. This thirsty desert ground in a dry and barren land, I bow down. I need you now. You are calling, I will come to your river, I will run. I bow down. I need you now. Oh, living water. Oh, God, my Savior. If I Like the winter wind. 
Awesome. Good morning, guys. Hey, I'm Scott Hall, one of the guys on the teaching team here. It's a pleasure to, uh, to be teaching with you this morning. Thank you for being here. Uh, if you guys ever need a second job, you could go to work for the Postal Service because a little bit of ice and snow didn't keep you from, uh, from getting here, so glad you're here. Uh, let, me, let, me, uh, let me start with just a couple of announcements and reiterate some things maybe you heard or maybe you missed on Stonegate News. Uh, we know that shows at the beginning, and a lot of times we miss those things. So uh, let me remind you of a couple of things. Number one, this Wednesday night is our Elements service. And if you haven't been to an Elements service here this Wednesday night, um, it is by far, uh, honestly, a lot of us who work here or uh, serve here, it's, it's our favorite service. It's a time, some heads are nodding out there already, those of you that go to, to Elements on a regular basis. It is an incredible time for us to come together as a family. And uh, we have babies on the stage not to uh, uh, christen or uh, do anything like that with them. We basically uh, celebrate the birth of the children and really w work into a time where we pray over the parents and, and stand as a family and say, we'll help you raise these kids uh, so that hopefully one day they'll come to know Christ. It's, that's an awesome time. Uh, we also have a time of baptism. There's a couple of pools of water we set up over here and we celebrate. We usually baptize about uh, 20 to 30 people on Wednesday nights. It's a great celebration. And then we have our, our time where we have our Lord's Supper uh, as well, or communion time together. And it, it's just a great time. So I want to remind you of that. If you haven't been, make this Wednesday night your first time to come and be a part of that. I promise you, you won't regret it. Also, if you've got kids or you know somebody that has kids that are eligible for camp, get them signed up. We're down the home stretch. So whatever you've got to do, tie them in a knot, put them in a suitcase, whatever you have to do to get your kids to camp, get them to camp. Why? It is perhaps the best number one opportunity for them to meet with Jesus uh, during the summer and perhaps all year. Great opportunity. Also, those of you who are men in the room, women, I'm not sliding you. You've got an opportunity on Wednesday nights. It's called At Dusk. It's a, it's a Bible study just for women. But I wanted to also invite you men in this room if you haven't been to our men's Bible study. On Wednesday mornings, it starts at 6.30 in the morning and we cut off at 7.15. I'm teaching right now through spiritual warfare. It's coming on the backside of a thought where we said God wants to do supernatural things in your life as men, as women too, but I'm speaking to men. He wants to do supernatural things through your life in the marketplace. And if you take that calling seriously, whatever your job is, your calling, if you take that seriously, then the reality is, is that the enemy is going to come after you. And so we're just practically talking through what does spiritual warfare look like in the life of us as men. Now for transition time, <clears throat> we just had this beautiful song sung over us. And so um, you know, just to, to go back to that moment just for, for a second, and I want to pray over you as we transition into the talk this morning, as we can continue our steadfast series through the book of James. How many of you this morning, after hearing this song just sung over you, that God's a living water, he will provide, but we walk through desert places where sometimes we feel pretty desperate in need of God. How many of you right now, just by a quick raise of hand, would say, you know what? I'm in that place where I need God. I need him to show up. If you just lift your hand just for a second, you realize you're in a place, a situation, a trial, a circumstance where you need to, to, for God to show up. So thank you for raising your hands. Let's pray, and I want to pray over you. I'm in one of those places as well with you, those of you who raised your hands, where I need God to to reveal himself and show me what the next step is for me. So let me pray over us and then we'll dive into our study together. Father, thank you for this morning. I thank you for the time that's ahead of us. I thank you for the, the folks in the room that raised their hand and the many probably who didn't feel comfortable raising their hand, but, but we find ourselves in a place where all we can do in our heart is to cry out and say we need you. Uh, Father, I believe the first step in moving forward is a confession of our heart that just says, I'm in a place where I can't do this and I need you to come be God in this moment with me and show me uh, what the next step is. So for those who, whose hearts are there this morning, Father, I pray that you give them favor. 
I pray that you had already begun to change their perspective and teach them to trust you so that you might release them from the moment they find themselves in so that they can go on to do the work you've called them to. It's in Jesus' name I pray these things, amen. Amen. Find your way to uh, James. We'll start in James chapter three here in just a moment. We've been <clears throat> looking at this idea of trials over the last three or four weeks together. And as we take a look at the slide here on the screen, I want to remind you of some of the things that, that we've been learning, that our needs that we walk through in the midst of circumstances, our needs expose our, our need and desire for God. And we basically have two paths when we face circumstances to default down into a me-centered path where we guard, protect, defend, and blame, or as we're gonna look at today, we have the opportunity to take this upward path where we exercise godly wisdom in our lives. So we've learned that our needs are exposed and tested through our circumstances. And we've also, we've also learned that in the midst of, of these trying times that it's not about asking God to get us out of the trial, it's about asking God to change our perspective while we're in the midst of the trial. I'm gonna to talk to you in just a moment that our focus, our attention should not be placed on the trial, but what God wants to be doing in our lives in the midst of the trial, and that's when our perspective begins to change. We begin to see beyond the trial and to see the work that God's doing in the midst of the trial to get us ready for what's next in our lives. So this change in perspective is really us moving to a point where we're asking God, this upward path, we're asking God to uh, allow and shape in us this godly wisdom that lets us see from his perspective. That's what a godly perspective is all about when we find ourselves in trials. It's that point we come to where we're able to see the trial through the lens of the heart and mind of God rather than a me-focused lens, lens that begins to guard, protect, defend, and even blame God for placing us in that circumstance in the first place. Here's, here's when we know we're beginning to reach that point where we're gonna be released from a trial. And I forgot what week we said this with the teaching team, but we come to this place where we say, God, don't deliver me until you develop me. God, don't deliver me from the trial until you do what you need to do in me so that I can be released to do the greater work that you're calling me to do. Now, I keep mentioning this idea of the greater work. And what, what I wanna try to do here is begin to shift your thinking away from trials so that we don't get high-centered on thinking about the trials, but that we begin to begin thinking about what God wants to do in our hearts in the midst of the trials. And here's the way I would say this to you. Trials are used to prepare and develop us for the greater work that God wants to do in our lives later. So they will either develop us, that's where we apply wisdom from above, or our trials will distract us because we are applying wisdom from below. Take a look at James chapter three, verse 13. We're gonna read verse 13 through 18, and this is gonna show us this pivotal point here where we have a choice, basically in every trial and decision, to employ this idea of a, a natural or uh, we default to this natural decision-making process where we guard, protect, defend, and blame, or we move into this category where we exercise godly wisdom and it actually begins to usher us out of our trial and into the next thing that God has called us to. James chapter three, verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. We worked through that idea in a whole week. What does it mean to, to work in this meekness of wisdom? Look at verse 14. But if you have a bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast, boast and be false to the, tr to the truth. What's he saying? If we make a choice right here to default to a me-centered kind of thinking, then we can be assured that we'll be bitter We'll be jealous. Other people aren't going through this. Why am I going through this? So I'm, I'm jealous of other people. That we're focused on the trials rather than focused on the godly wisdom that's, that's from above. 
We start to work real hard with selfish ambition out of our hearts. Okay, God, if you're not going to get me out of my trial, then I'm going to work myself out of this trial. I'm going to figure out, based on my wisdom, on this earthly thinking, how I can get myself out of the trial. Now, this is a sure sign for us that our attention now is no longer fixed on God. It's fixed on ourselves and how we can get ourselves out of a trial. And so the trial has become a distraction to us. And the trial is, in fact, keeping us in a place where we will not accomplish the greater works that God wants to do in our lives because we're so me-centered in the midst of our trials. But look at verse 15. The Bible says, this is not wisdom that comes from above. It's earthly. It's unspiritual. Now, check this word out. It's demonic. So when we get to a place where we decide to default to me, myself, and I, and we start asking God, why, 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 instead of God, what do you want to do in me? And we're so focused on ourselves and we we fill ourselves with selfish ambition because we don't believe we should be in that trial in the first place. And if we were running the show, we would not have walked ourselves through this trial. So we start blaming God. The Bible says this is in wisdom that comes from God. It's earthly wisdom, it's unspiritual, and it's actually demonic. Now, it reminds you, he's writing to Christians. James is writing to a group of believers that are spread all over the world, and they're encountering all kinds of different trials. But he says, look, there's a godly way to walk through it, and there's an ungodly way to walk through it. Look at how he describes the godly way in verse 17. There is a wisdom that comes from above, and it is pure Then it is peaceable, it's gentle, it's open to reason, it's full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. That's what we can expect from God when we begin to align ourselves with this upward path of thinking that's called wisdom from above. It's going to be something that bring, that's pure. It's something that brings peace in our lives. It's something that brings a gentle calm on us. It allows our hearts to be open to reason, full of mercy, and it produces good fruit. Look at verse 18. At the end of it, it produces a harvest of righteousness. What is God after in the trials? He's after a harvest of righteousness. Righteousness is a big Bible word. It just simply means that we're in right standing with God or we are in step with God. We're walking with God in a way that honors and glorifies him. Now, here's the reality. Trials are going to come, but they are not meant to distract us. They're meant to develop us so that we can become the person God wants us to be so that there can be a harvest of righteousness in our lives. All of us want to walk with God. We do. Even a person that doesn't know that yet longs to walk with God. That's how we're created. We're created with a place in our heart that where resides this longing to to want to walk with God and know God and be known by God. God says the way to get there is to begin thinking with wisdom from above, and He will He'll provide that. Let me tell you why we often get caught right here. Now let me say this. Again, we can't get high-centered on trials in our lives. We can't let them distract us. They are going to come. They're there on purpose. Sometimes, sometimes God walks us into the trials. Sometimes we make bad choices when our needs are exposed and they're not met. We try to meet them on our own instead of relying on God to meet them. So that choice sends us in a trial. But the outcome is still the same for God. He still is going to use that trial to develop us. So whether we get there on our own choice by choosing this default response, a natural response, or we get to the trial because we choose godly wisdom and he sends us into a trial to develop us, the reality is he's using it to develop you so that you'll be better prepared for what's ahead of you. Let me give you an illustration. My son's 16 years old and I'm working him through the driver's ed, the online driver's ed course. Um, It's a blessing to work your child through an online driver's ed course. And so we've just, we were at that last test that he has to take to pass the whole thing. And there's this question that was stumping us up because, you know, I was kind of helping him on that. And um, so we're walking through this and, and the question was based on this idea of how far your headlights will shine. 
I even forgot what the theory is called, but I know what the theory says. That there is a distance in a car that your headlights will shine, and beyond that distance is the distance of a question mark. There could be danger there. There could be a deer in the road. There could be a sharp corner that you don't see. But as we're driving, there's this point that we know what we see, but there's the danger of what lies beyond that. And so as we begin thinking through this idea of the trials, here's the reality. God sees beyond what we can see. He sees beyond that place where the headlights of our lives shine, he sees beyond that. And he is preparing you and me for the greater work that he wants to do in and through our lives in that place that our lights don't shine on yet. You see, the work that he's doing in the trials to make us, to make us rightly aligned with him, to produce this harvest of righteousness, he's working through the trials to prepare us for where our lights don't yet shine, but he sees completely clear. And so if, if trials distract us, what happens is we don't learn to have a rightly aligned perspective. We do not learn to trust God. And so we don't obey God. We, we stay in this cycle of guard, protect, defend, and blame. So if we get distracted by the trial, what God does then is sends us to another trial and sends us to another trial until we learn to apply godly perspective, we learn to trust him, and we learn to obey him so that we'll be prepared for what's next. Today, I wanna shift your thinking from the trials. And I wanna ask this question, get you to ponder through this question with me. What happens when we start to apply godly wisdom in our lives? What happens when we reach a place in our heart like it was sung over us a minute ago where we simply say, God, I I need you. I'm here, but this selfish ambition, this hard work that I'm putting in is not rescuing me from this. I need you to come after me in the midst of this and put me on the path where godly wisdom is exercised in my life. Why? because I wanna do the greater works that you're calling me to. Ladies and gentlemen, today, we're gonna talk about a season of waiting. A season of waiting that God ushers us into when we finally get to that place where we say, God, I wanna exercise godly wisdom. I I wanna start thinking with a godly perspective. I want to learn to trust and obey you so that I'll be prepared for what's next in my life. When our heart gets to that place, that's where God generally sends us in to a season of waiting. It's why why James in in the first chapter in verse 2 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Where is steadfastness grown up and matured in our lives? It's in the period of waiting. It's in the season of waiting. It's in the desert places that God takes us to before he releases us to do the greater work that he's calling us to do in our lives. It's the season and the place where steadfastness takes its full effect. That's why James says, look, count it all joy when you see the trials, because when you see the trials, you know God's doing his work in your life to prepare you for what's next. Today, I want to begin talking with you about this season of waiting and really what it's all about. You know, we can look back in the Bible and see many people have gone through seasons of waiting. David, the great king that we see in the Old Testament, he, he went through a long season of waiting where he was a, a shepherd boy watching sheep out in the wilderness. But basically, you know, we might look at that and go, well, he was just a, a little shepherd boy out in the wilderness doing what his dad told him to do. No, he's not because he became a great warrior and it was the skills in the, in the wilderness and in the desert where he was watching the sheep. It was the skills that he learned there that enabled him to be the mighty warrior that he would become so that God could use him for the greater work that he needed and wanted to do in his life. Listen, you may be in a season of waiting. I'm in a season of waiting. I feel like I've been there about eight or 10 years. I feel like I've been in this place where God's preparing me. He's trying to teach me to look at things from a godly perspective. He's shaping things in my heart. He's refining me. 
I feel like he's trying to teach me once again what it looks like to trust him because I, I often get down here and try to figure out things for myself only to realize I'm one decision away from allowing my heart to be aligned with God so I'm on this upper path again where I'm learning to trust him. David walked through that. Moses walked through that. He was born, his, his mother put him in a, in a little reed basket and put him in the river and just sent him off because all the kids of that age were being, being murdered by the uh, emperor in power that time in Egypt. And so he goes down the river and he's found by this lady, this young lady, not any young lady, it was the Pharaoh's daughter. And so he goes into a season of waiting where he is raised as an Egyptian while his people were being ushered into a brutal period of 400 years of slavery. And he had it good, seemingly, right? That's what we would want, the riches and the glory and the the big house and and all the stuff that he had. But God began to shape his perspective and see that his people were enslaved and in chains and brutally beating. And he began to use that time to shape Moses to be the leader that he would be. You look at Jesus Jesus had a ministry of three years on this earth. His period of waiting just to display what and how God works in and through our lives in this period of waiting, his waiting was 30 years basically as he was, he was growing up and, and God was shaping him for that moment where he would release the idea to the world that this is the Messiah, this is the Savior. And so he went through this season where God was preparing and shaping him for the work that he was going to do on the cross for us. Let me tell you about the season of waiting. Just to get real practical with you, three things that God's after in the season of waiting. The first is this. It's a place he will take us to shape our perspective. It's a place God will take us where he shapes our perspective. It's a wilderness experience. It's a desert experience like we were just having sung over us where living water has to come and replenish us because when we get down into this earthly kind of of path, we get to a place where we think the things of this earth satisfy us only to realize that it moves us into this cycle over and over and over of why God, why God, why are you doing this to me? Instead of God, what are you trying to teach me in the midst of this? The season of waiting is a place where perspective is shaped. We can know that our perspective is being shaped in a godly way and we're beginning to apply godly wisdom in our lives when we we start saying the statement this way. God, what are you doing in my life or in me rather than God, why are you doing this to me? You see, when we enter into a natural path on this wisdom from below, the enemy creeps into our lives and calls us to question our trust in God, and we begin to ask, why are you doing this to me? In other words, if I were writing the script, I, have, I would not have written it this way. Why are you sending me through these trials? You see, when we begin to gla- grasp it, this this. Uh, wisdom that comes from above, our heart changes away from why are you doing this to God, what are you trying to do in me? When we get to a place in our our trials where we ask God, what are you trying to do in me? It's It's this place where our heart turns and we begin to trust God with whatever work he needs to do in our lives. And so the season of waiting is not a period of inaction. It's not a period where we're just idle. It's the period where the work of God gets done in our lives. So that, I want to keep saying this so that you'll you'll capture it, so that we are better prepared for what he is calling us to that we don't yet see. I hope you believe that, folks. I hope you believe that God has a call on your life. Your calling right now is whatever you're doing for a living. I hope you're learning to trust God and allow him to shape your perspective so that you can be all you can be as a Christ follower in whatever you do for a living so that God will be glorified. Why does the enemy want us to take this path? Because he's trying to steal the glory of God away from God. And he does that by using trials to distract us shifting our mind towards the why rather than us thinking that trials are supposed to develop us. God, what are you doing in me? So first, season of waiting is a place where our perspective is shaped. Secondly, it's a place where we learn to trust God, where we learn to trust him. This is how God uses the trials. 
He moves us to a place where our needs and our inadequacies are brought to the surface in the midst of our circumstances. Only for God in the middle of that moment where we feel undone and helpless and vulnerable for God to say to us, trust me. God uses trials to teach us to trust him. He does that by taking us to the ends of ourselves, by showing us our shortcomings and our inadequacies, not to beat us down. And to say, you worthless follower of Christ, I knew you would never measure up. I knew you would never be able to do it. Guess what? God already knows us. He doesn't beat us down like that. He shows us our shortcomings and our inadequacies inadequacies so that he can get to a place and get us to a place where he can just whisper in our ears, trust me. You can trust me. And we've worked ourselves to the bone here trying to figure it out only to realize we can't. And so he gets us to a place where we'll listen to him and begin to say, all right, I trust you. Let's begin to move forward. And so the last thing he starts to do in us is, is he, in this season of waiting, is he, he begins to prepare us for what's next. Listen, he will not begin to prepare us for what's next until we deeply trust him with our lives. I mean, it's no two-sided street here. It's not have your cake and eat it too. It's not do whatever I want to do, me, myself, and I, and oh, 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 by the way, God, also do that thing and you do my life to, to make me great and to make you look good. It doesn't work that way. It's a sellout. It's a deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him. It's an all or nothing. And he uses these trials to get us to a place where we trust him so that we can be prepared for the greater work that God wants to do in and through our lives. Man, I don't have time to unpack this. I really don't. But I'm going to say this because I think the Spirit's laying it on my heart and it's for somebody in this room. Some of you are so deep down into this game right here that you don't believe that God will and can use you for anything great. Because you've walked this path so long and you've even used it as a path now to protect yourself, isolate yourself, and insulate yourself from relationships and anybody that says, I want to dive into your mess and help you. If that's you, you're one decision away from opening up your heart to hear God's whisper that says, trust me, and I'm gonna bring people alongside you that you can trust and find worthy to be trustworthy in your life, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do some incredible things, and I am going to prepare you for a greater work that he longs to do in your life. Listen, if that's you this morning and you don't believe you can ever be used by God because you're so deep in that game, you're the pro, you're the master at it, listen, God's bigger than that. He's bigger than your problems, he's bigger than your trials, and he comes after you in the midst of that because he loves you and he's gracious and he wants to produce a harvest of righteousness in your life. And you say, I can't have a harvest produced in my life. All I've been producing in my life is, I'm not even gonna say the word that just came to my mind. But you know what it is because the enemy beats you down And he whispers that word in your life and says that's what identifies you. And if you're a child of God, it does not identify you. And your season of waiting, your desert experience with the Lord awaits you and it's a great place. We see the season of waiting as an undesired period. We do, we don't wanna go there. Where we want to go is straight out of trial into glory, hallelujah, life is great and I'm happy. My family's healthy, everything's good, my job is, I mean, the person driving me crazy, my job's been transferred to Fort Worth, I don't have to put up with them anymore, everything is wonderful, that's what we want. But God says, no, I'm going to take you through a place where I'm going to prepare you because you don't even see the work I want to do in your life yet. And so we see it as an undesired period of transition, but God sees it as a place where enslaved people are transformed into the people that he needs them to be because he wants to do and longs to do a greater work in their lives. 
So your test, your trial, your circumstances, listen, your season of waiting, it's never just about you. It's about God preparing you so that all of us can walk in community together and produce a harvest of righteousness together. I, I can't unpack this either. I'm already out of time. The reality is when we get right here, we become so me-focused and me-centered, we forget about the rest of the community of God. The work that God wants to do in and through your life right here is to prepare you for the greater work, but so that you can come along with everybody in this room and everybody that's a part of this fellowship in community so that we can do the greater work that God's calling us to do as the body of Christ. Man, this season of waiting is a, is a great season. I want to close. Turn to, to Psalm 51.10. Let's, let's close with this thought today. Psalm 51.10. This is a place with King David where the Lord is working on his heart. And if I could share a few things with you, a few things that will help you start to, well, it'll, it'll put you in a position where God can do the work in your heart that he longs to do in the season of waiting so that you'll be ready to be released to the land of blessing that he has for you. Psalm 51, verse 10. This is David praying. After he slept with another man's wife and then had that man killed to try to cover it up, but it didn't cover it up, God said, all right, I'm gonna take that child. He kills the baby. God has this baby die stillborn. And so that's the situation we're entering into with David. He saw her bathing on a rooftop, found her to be beautiful, made a choice, to exercise earthly wisdom. And he's, he went after me, myself, and I. And it turned into a pretty rough season for him. But God used that season to usher him into a season of waiting that actually translated into a greater work that he wanted to do later in his life. So we pick up, and David says, creating me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then, see, we want to go straight to then. Then I'm going to get out of my issue. Then I'm going to do the work that, that you want to do in my, my life, God. We want to go straight to then, but the season of waiting in it has this idea of, of creating in us a clean heart, restoration, abiding in the spirit of God. He goes on to say in verse 13, then I will teach transgressors your ways. You see, David understood that God had a greater work that he wanted to do in his life, that after he walked through this season, that God was going to release him to teach transgressors God's ways. Literally, that means to teach people who do not know God the ways of God, that they might trust and obey and taste and see that God is good. So David gives us a few things here that I want to share with you in closing today that we need to be focused on when we find ourselves in a season of waiting. If you are not there right now, congratulations. You're going to get there at some point because we go from trial to trial to season of waiting to trial to season of waiting on and on and on until we draw our breaths last because God's always working. So here's the first thing we ask for. We're in a season of waiting. God, restore me. We ask for God to restore us. David said, creating me a clean heart, O God. Listen to this. This word, this is beautiful. The word create means to shape and fashion something to be used uniquely and creatively. If I could give you God's picture for your life, his heart for you, what he wants to do in you is to create this kind of heart, a heart that is fashioned for something to be used uniquely and creatively. Why does God send us into seasons of waitings? So we can get to a point where we cry out and say, God, restore me. Restore my heart. Restore that uniquely, creatively fashioned part of me that you want to use for the greater works of the kingdom. So David got to a point where he said, create this, reshape this in me. And what was he asking for him to reshape? A clean heart. Now get this, this, this word here, clean, refers to the process of focusing on restoring moral and selfless purity in our motives and passions. You didn't get that. Let me give it to you again. It's a place where God takes us, where he restores the focus of our moral and selfless purity in our motives and our passions. Why is that important? Because when our motives and passions 
are exploited by the enemy, it sends us into this cycle in the chart. And that's what the enemy longs to do in us. But God, on the other hand, who has uniquely and creatively shaped us to do greater works for his kingdom, says, if you will ask, I will restore, and I'll create in you a clean heart, restoring your moral and selfless focus that's gone awry, I will refocus it on me, and it will not be selfless, and it will be morally pure. Second thing that you need to do when you're in the season of of waiting is this, to refocus. David says, God, renew a right spirit on me. So we ask for the restoration, then we ask God to refocus us. And this is just working through repairing and renewing our gaze upon God. For us to get to a place where once again we say, God, I'm fully committed, I'm, I'm all in, my heart's realigned and my mind is set on you. That's what it means to refocus on him. The third thing is this. In the season of waiting, we want to get to a place where we are reassured. So we're restored, we're refocused, and we're reassured. Because if you and I are honest, when we wrestle with this part of the, the, the graph, if you will, or these kind of decision-making processes, we're not steady. We are not assured of ourselves. This is probably the weakest moments of our identity that we will ever face when we venture out on our own saying we can run our lives better than God can run it. When we get to that place, it's a place where David said, he got there, he said, God, don't cast your spirit from me. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. In other words, he got so isolated in a place where he didn't even feel like God was there with him anymore. And so he's saying, God, reassure me. Don't cast your spirit away from me. Don't, don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. God, show me that you're with me right now in the midst of this because I want to be here. I want to be used by you in the way that you want to use me. And so he was asking for reassurance. It's just a confession. Ladies and gentlemen, anytime you find yourself here, one confession of the heart, one decision of the heart, one change of mind that's just like that moves you to this upward category of exercising godly wisdom in your life. If you're here, you're not stuck here. You're one heartbeat away from trusting God and learning to gain his perspective so that he will release you out of the trial that you find yourself in. But here's the warning, and then I'll close. The warning is if we get to a place where we're isolated and we don't get to a place in our heart where we're saying, God, restore me, refocus me, now reassure me, reassure me of the call that you have on my life. If we don't get there, then we will continue to walk through a longer season of trials because the trial has distracted us from God. We fixed our attention on self rather than on him, and so he's gonna use the next trial to develop us in the next trial to develop us until we will fix our eyes once again on the author and perfecter of our faith. If you get bogged down in reading the Old Testament, that's what the Old Testament's all about. It's about a people for 40 years. They went through a cycle of, I think I trust God. Well, I don't really trust God. I disobey God. Oh, God, come back to me and help me again. I trust God. I don't think I trust God. I disobey God. And they stay in this cycle. So the warning is, if we don't get to a place where we're saying, God, reassure me by restoring and refocusing me, he'll keep sending us through the bottom portion of this chart until we get to the end of ourselves. And it's only then that he releases me. This is the fourth thing, and we're done. We're in a season of waiting. We're asking for God to restore us, refocus us, and reassure us so that he might release us. That's where we want to go right off the bat, and God says, no, there's a season of waiting where you need to be prepared for what's next. You don't even see it, but it's going to be great and amazing. So here's the conclusion for today. The season of waiting may be an undesired season for all of us. I don't like it, but I can see what God's doing in me. I mean, all of us can think about times in our life where we look back 15 years and go, oh, I see what God did in that time to prepare me for what I'm walking through today. Hindsight's 2020. The thing is, God sees it all, right? So we can trust him in this season of waiting. And so the season of waiting is our greatest potential of growth. It's that place where God meets us and shapes our perspective teaches us to trust him so that he, he can release us into the land of blessing that we all long for. 
because we're all built to honor and glorify God. The season of waiting is the pathway to get to those moments. Let's pray. God, thanks for today, and thank you for these beautiful people, for the, just the connection during this time, seeing their eyes, the head nods, the smiles. I pray that you would uh, help us be a people that trust you, that are driven by your perspective. God, show us as a body the greater work that you want to do in us. God, as you begin to show us that, help us as individuals to be able to take our trials seriously as a place where you develop us and you take us into a season of waiting so that we can be refocused and be released by you. We trust you for that, even though sometimes it's a difficult journey. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and have a great week.